Okay, so our first speaker tonight. Oops. Dr. Michelle Bean is co-owner of Optimal Health and Fitness, a holistic health center that integrates acupuncture, chiropractic, nutritional ketosis, fitness, and other modalities. She also co-leads an outdoor fitness boot camp, has a black belt in mixed martial arts, and loves to edu educate individuals on many aspects of health. Tonight, she'll be talking to us about endocannabinoids and the receptors that are found throughout the entire body, in the brain, organs, connective tissues, glands, and immune cells, where they regulate a constant homeostasis. So please welcome Michelle Bean. Wow, this is incredible. <laughs> I'd love to see all everyone out here today. Um, it's really interesting that on the timing, everyone's like, this is great timing. This is really good timing, you know, for to be up here speaking about uh, cannabis. And uh, tomorrow's actually, today's 419, but tomorrow's 420. Does anyone catch that? The big, yeah. So if only it was a day later. We actually, I'm from Santa Cruz. I live in Santa Cruz right now, and it's practically a national holiday in Santa Cruz <laughs> every year. So, yes. <laughs> so just so I know who I'm talking to, I'm just going to ask a couple questions. Uh, and first of all, does every, everyone's familiar with the term cannabis. Is, any, is everyone familiar with the term cannabis? Most, most people. Okay, and when I talk about, and I'm going to go through all of this terminology, and I'm, I'm going I'm to go through it slow, <laughs> um, and cannabidiol. So this has been a huge interest of mine uh, for maybe about, I'm, I'm a newbie, so I'm going to say about four years, maybe five years. And uh, I, when I grew up, marijuana was the term that I used, and marijuana was illegal for me, you know, and it was the evil thing to do, like say no to drugs. And I've grown up with that understanding. I'm only a little grown up, actually. <laughs> but up until this time, I've grown up with this understanding that, you know, the, the pot is bad and marijuana is bad, and it's never been something that's been in my consciousness. So about four years ago, uh, I'm a, so I'm a chiropractor, and about four years ago, uh, my mom went into surgery uh, for her back. Actually, back up 20 years ago, she went in, uh, for a back surgery, and it was failed. It was a failed back surgery. So she spent about 17, 18 years of the rest of that part in misery and pain. And back, you know, 20 years ago, when they did surgery, they would take a piece of the bone from the hip, they would scrape that bone, and then they would put it as part of the fusion. They'd use it. So for 15 years, my mom's been suffering not so much even from the back pain, the original source, but from where they took the bone. But that being said, she's been on this constant, ongoing, uh, she, she went down the funnel, right? You know, in, in, in the, the traditional American model of, of treating chronic pain. So, and it got so bad, and, and I believe it's because of that fusion that the rest of her spine just continued to deter deteriorate. So, uh, four years, four years uh, ago, she was going in for a full spinal surgery, and they wouldn't even touch her spine because her neck was so bad. So she first had to go in and get her neck fused, and they fused her from about C3 to C7, so pretty much her entire neck is fused. And then a year later, they fused the rest of her spine. So she has two freely mov movable joints in her spine right now. And being a chiropractor <laughs> and really understanding the nervous system and, and, and the correlation between movement and spinal movement and gravity and how our brain processes information and life, really this was detrimental to me. But even more than that, when, you know, just right before the surgery, the neurosurgeon takes us into the office and says, you know what, we have a really big concern here and that's that your mom is on pretty much every medication that she can be taking right now to con try and control her pain, but none of that worked, right? So she was maxed out on medication. And the neurosurgeon told us our biggest fear is that when we take her off of the anesthesia, that we're not going to be able to control her pain. And that fear became a reality. So she went through the surgery and came out of 
came out of surgery and was spent about three days in ICU. And typically the people who go in for this type of surgery will spend at least 24 hours in ICU. And the main purpose of that was to control her pain. So she was in really, really constant high amount of pain for a good, a good two and a half days till it finally came down to a, a level that they could control. And then of course they took her and put her on the main floor and you know, three or four days goes by and she starts moving bowels you know, and she can get out of bed, and so they send her home. And they call that a successful surgery, right? <laughs> so in the back of my mind, I keep thinking, I keep hearing this term, medical marijuana, right? Medical marijuana. And I keep pushing away because I'm like, no, that's, you know, those are drugs. You know, we can't, we can't, I'm not going to give my mom drugs. <laughs> um, and it just get, got louder and louder and louder for me until finally one day I started, you know, and I did, I did Dr. Google. I'm like, Google, you know, uh, because I didn't know where else to find this information. It wasn't readily available for me, and I didn't really even know where to go and look for it. Thank goodness I was looking at it a few weeks before her surgery, and I ended up getting her medical marijuana card, and I got the caregiver card so that I could go to the dispensaries and, and get her uh, what she needed. I didn't know what I was doing, had no idea, literally. <laughs> and uh, so we, you know, we, we t I take her home. She came to, sa her surgery was in San Francisco, and I took her home with me to Santa Cruz, where she spent six weeks with me. But the very first thing I did, you know, we walk her down and put her in the car, and I took the lidocaine patches off of her back, and I replaced them with a one-to-one -one ratio of CBD THC. You know, I got her home, and we started playing with the different tinctures that I had. And it was pretty phenomenal that within about three days, my mom, who was living at a chronic, you know, 10 plus on the pain scale, dropped down to about a six for the first time in a very long time. A couple days later, she was down to about a three. And by the end of the first week, she had no pain. And, and, she, and, and she's been on a lot of medication. She's one week, about two weeks post-surgery now with a lot of inflammation in her body. So I was super impressed. <laughs> About three weeks later, and again, mind you, I know there's some doctors in this room. I didn't know what I was doing. <laughs> Somehow, magically, about three weeks later, I start pulling medications off her shelf because her blood pressure comes down. You know, the anxiety that she chronically lived with was kind of evening out. You know, even her pain medication, her opioids started working a lot better. And I just slowly started, at the end of six weeks, my mom had been we took about four or five medications off her, her shelf. And if I would have known what I know now, I wouldn't have done that <laughs> because I didn't realize that she actually had to taper off of some of these. They're very dangerous drugs. So I'm not recommending this by any means. It's just the way that it happened for us. And then I started going back and I thought, what in the world just happened? You know, why didn't I know about this 20 years ago? And I was pissed. I was really upset because I feel that my mom probably wouldn't have had to have that surgery, at least not the way that it happened in that way, and wouldn't have had to live with that much pain. And I was angry at the world because I'm like, why isn't anybody telling me this? You know, why do I have to go, why did she have to go through all that before I opened, thank goodness that I had some interest in it. You know, I know there's a lot of people that suffer who don't have an advocate. So that's why I'm here. <laughs> that's what I'm here. So it's, we're a few years into it now, and I've taken some time to try and understand and digest some of this information so I can try and relay that to you. Um, there's a lot of terminologies in this, so I'm going to try and, um, try and keep it as simple as I can. Um, but I think, I think you guys will follow. Up here? Ta-da, it works. <laughs> Good. So that's me. Uh, like I said, I live in Santa Cruz, California, um, so I'm happy to be down here uh, in Palo Alto. Uh, I'm a co-owner, uh, co-business owner of this uh, Optimal Health and Fitness, and I do run around on the beach, you know, three or four times in the morning, 6.15 boot camp, so we get to really connect with nature out there. Uh, and I'm super interested in cellular health. That's one of my main things. I'm a chiropractor, but through this chiropractic lens, I'm really trying to understand like how the body works in a physiological state as well as just like the outside world as well. So um, I was going to say something about that. Here we go. So I'm not going to spend too much time talking about the history 
of cannabis, but I'm just going to mention a couple of things. I said a little long short because I thought maybe we didn't have that much time and I really don't want to dive into the history of it. <laughs> but it has a very extensive history. This isn't new. It's definitely new to me and my generation. Uh, but this, is, this plant has been on this earth for, for as long as 25 million years, they're saying. It's been around for a very, very long time. And if we look back into history, it has been used, you know, in the Middle East. It's been used medicinally. It's been used, you know, the Syrians used it both to, they said, they say something like to, to not have, you know, like, the struggles of daily life, you know, like the way they said stuff, you know, in, in different cultures. But it was kind of this idea of, like, you know, stress and anxiety is what we would call that today. Um, definitely, you know, the Greeks and the Romans didn't even know the psychoactive components, or they, they didn't use the psychoactive, which I'm, Imagine they probably had higher CBD plants. We'll talk about that in a moment also. But they used it specifically just for anti-inflammatory purposes. There's a lot of uh, documented cases. In the Indians, Chinese medicine, my business partner is an acupuncturist, and she's just graduated. She's graduating this weekend, but she just turned in her dissertation today on uh, a, a review, a systematic review of how Chinese medicine and cannabis has been used it's in all the classic textbooks. You know, she's literally, she has books that are like this big, you know, and this thick. Let's have a little bit of dust on them. And she's flipping through these books, looking at all of the uses and how it's been used in Chinese medicine for years. So even here, you know, in the United States, before 1937, before the Tax Act, the Marijuana Tax Act, uh, industrial hemp and cannabis was used for many, many purposes. It's not always just been, you know, as a as a psychoactive or a recreational use, but it's been used you know, as food and medicine, uh, oil, fabrics, rope, paper. Uh, the American flag, I think what the American flag was originally made out of hemp. Is that right? And, and all of the first curt, like all of the dollar bills, all of them were made out of hemp. Also, the Cuse Constitution is written on hemp paper. So it has a very long history here. <laughs> Um, in the early 1950s, it's funny, I saw an uh, Eli and Lily, I'm pretty sure it was Eli and Lily, has a tincture. It's a CBD THC tincture. And then you turn on the back, it says, for use in migraines, um, pain, and that time of month that a woman is slightly psychotic or something. <laughs> the way they phrase it, but the idea is for premenstrual, for cramps. <laughs> um, so, and and you, could, like, you could go to your pharmacist in the early 1900s and they had prescriptions. It was part of the pharmacopoeia in this country in the early, 19, 18, early 1900s. So 1937, I don't want to get too much into that, um, but it all goes away. Right, 1937, the Medical Marijuana Act, and uh, they they take the cannabis away, and we don't hear for it about it, you know, for for several years, uh, and that's not completely true. I know there's a lot of, there's been a lot of advocates, and that's why it actually stayed around. Um, does anybody here use Bitmoji? <laughs> what the hemp are we talking about, anyways? Anyways, <laughs> that was just in case anyone uses Bitmojis. I wanted to play with that. So what, the, what are we talking about? You know, when we're talking about CBD, or we're talking about cannabis, or we're talking about medical marijuana, or pot, or hashish, whatever it is. That I grew up calling it doobies. I didn't know that's what we were like, doobies. You know? uh, they were terrible, I thought. So cannabis has three main components to it. And I'm going to talk specifically about the cannabinoids. And, but before I talk about the cannabinoids, I just want you to know that there's two other really important components of it. Uh, and again, this could take a very long time. I, did, I did, do have more time than I thought. <laughs> so we could maybe get into it. But the terpenes are the oils. It's part of the oil that's in the plant. And there's so many different strains right now. And if you go to one of your dispensaries, you can ask for the profile if they happen to have it. And there's all these different essential oils that are part of the plant. And they're not specific to cannabis. You, can, you find them in plants all over. They're, they're, the terpenes are everywhere. So they're essential oils, basically. And it gives it its aromatic component. They're also very medicinal. And those you can look up when you find the terpene profile of any plant. You can actually look up and see what all the terpene profile is and its qualities that it has. The flavonoids give it its pig pigmentation, so the color, the bright colors in some fruits, some of the vegetables. And then the cannabinoids, are, they're, they're one of the active components. 
And at this point right now, I think we've got, I have on here 90 plus. The last thing I read, I, th I think it was about 150 different cannabinoids that have been discovered in the cannabis plant. So the first one was Raphael Meshulam. Anyone familiar with Raphael out of Israel? He's a deaf, if you want more information from this type of stuff, look up Raphael Meshulam. He's out of Israel. He is pretty much kind of the founding father here who made a lot of the very first discoveries that allowed us to go down this path. Of course, we have technology now, which is pretty amazing, that's going to allow us to understand why this is making such a big deal in the body. So the first one, the first uh, cannabinoid to be discovered in the plant is THC. So that's the psychoactive component. We know it is the main psychoactive component of the cannabis plant. And then the second one that was discovered a couple years later was CBD. And because these two are found particularly in higher ratios than any of the other cannabinoids, they were the ones that were discovered first. Right? So CBD is commonly, no, it is the non, one of the non-psychoactive components of cannabis. And then you'll see on the circle out there, it's kind of hard to see this. Uh, but you'll see on the other circle out there's a couple other cannabinoids, and they're starting to test all these different cannabinoids and how they work synergistically with all of the other ones, with the terpenes and the flavonoids and the other cannabinoids. Uh, but it gets really complicated. But the reason, you guys, that we're talking about CBD today is because if you can see this area right here, all of the discoveries right now, all the testing, what they're showing us is that over and over again, it's starting to... We're starting to understand you know, antibacterial uh, inhibits cancer cell growth, neuroprotective, so it protects the brain and the central nervous system, bone growth, so fractures, uh, blood sugar levels, diabetes, a lot of implications here, reduces inflammation, artery blockage, I mean, it just goes on and on. So this is what the research is showing us is that as they're diving into all this research, there's so many different parts of the body that it's having at least an influence on, some kind of influence on. And we, I want to know why. And why is it hitting so many different parts of the body, right? So the other thing that's important to know about cannabinoids is at this point there's three different types. We can talk about three different types of cannabinoids. So the phytocannabinoid is from plant. So that's the extraction, the cannabinoids, the extractions that we're getting out of the plant itself. And then we have endocannabinoids. So endo is endogenous. It means the body makes it. So we actually have cannabinoids that our body endogenous endogenously make, right? And then we have the synthetic cannabinoids. So that's is our pharmaceuticals that are getting involved now. So we actually do have different synthetic, man-made, laboratory-made cannabinoids that also influence the same receptors I'm going to be talking about in a minute. But I'm going to talk specifically about the phytocannabinoids and the endocannabinoids. How are we doing? We doing all right? <laughs> the other thing I'm going to say real quick, side note, is that as, because I am a chiropractor, and an hour is a long time to be sitting in your seat, if you need to get up <laughs> and move around, then please do. I do it all the time, so, and I will not be offended if you get up and move around, so if, if you need that, please do it. So the receptors, Every, anyone, is everyone familiar with what receptors are? We have, we have the cell, right? And then on the outside of the cell we have, they're kind of like antennas, right? They're receiving parts of the cell. And so these receptors, they receive information from outside, some inside the body and outside the body. We get this information and it goes into the cell and it, and it has a, an effect on what the cell's going to do. So the receptors that have been found, so first we found, I told you we found, we discovered CBD and THC, right? And so if, we, if those are the main active components, the next question was, well, they must be reacting with something and the discovery was that we have receptors in our body that directly bind these chemicals, right? And so as they begin to study these, they say, this isn't brand new. It has, it's not something that just happened, occurred over the next the last hundred years. They find that these receptors have evolved over 600 million years, and pretty much every chordate has them, everything above the insect level, right? So everything that has a vertebra has these receptors for cannabinoids plant and endogenous. So this is a really big deal, right? This is a really big deal that we have these receptors in our body that directly bind the plant. So this is, 
This is an introduction to the endocannabinoid system. So we can think of, again, I said endo is endogenous. It means something that our body makes. And cannabinoids, you know, once the discovery of the cannabinoids and then the receptors, the, the term stuck with, they, they stuck with the term endocannabinoid, and then it's a system. So you can think of it in terms like we know that we have, you know, a cardiovascular system, and we have an endocrine system, and we have a nervous system and an immune system, right? So think of the endocannabinoid system as another system of the body that acts on multiple sy systems of the body and other areas of the body. The endocannabinoid system itself is the receptors that we just talked about. It is the cannabinoids and it is, and it is all of the enzymes, right? The enzymes that are gonna create and break down these different cannabinoids and the receptors themselves. So, the discovery of, the, they call it CB1 and CB2 receptors, and there's actually two more. I don't want to get into those because it gets really confusing. But CB1 receptors, they find are in the brain and in the central nervous system. So we have receptors that are on our brain and our central nervous system, so the spinal cord and the nerves that come off the level to innervate all of our organs, right, and the muscles. They have these CB1 receptors which directly bind the cannabinoids, so they directly bind the endocannabinoids, the ones that our body makes, and the phytocannabinoids, right? And then it has a direct and immediate influence on the brain and the central nervous system. CB2, here's, I'm gonna go back to that slide. Um, so here's some of the areas in the brain that they're testing, right? They're, one of the biggest areas, and we'll talk about this in a minute, is for pain control, right? This is why it works so incredibly well for pain is because a lot of the areas of the brain that that control pain have a high amount of these receptors in them that directly bind, right? So the cerebellum also, which is sensory and fine-tuning movement, so a lot of work, the basal ganglia, a lot of work around multiple sclerosis, right? Trying to control the different movement patterns, uh, the reward centers of the brain, so a lot of work around addictions, um, the limbic system, emotional centers of the brain. The w cool thing about these receptors is that you do not find them in the respiratory part of the brainstem, right? So where opioid receptors, they're in there, and that's why there can be some, there are so many fatalities, right? Because people start breathing, because once you get an overdose of the respiratory centers, the, res the respiration stops, so there's a lot of fatalities. But there aren't those receptors. The same receptors are not found in the brainstem, which means you cannot overdose on cannabis. You can have a lot, and if it has a lot of THC in it, <laughs> what's gonna happen? You're gonna get really high, right? <laughs> and the sense is that there's this impending doom. You know, if you have way too much THC in your body, the idea is like, oh my gosh, like there's, you can cause anxiety and you can create a lot of like really uncomfortable feelings, but you don't actually die. It cannot kill you for the same reason. So that's a, that's, that's a, that's a really big discovery. So let me go back to this one. Um, the CB2 receptors are found in the peripheral of the body, so, so more of the organ systems and the immune system. So a lot of work around, uh, around the immune system. So a lot of studies trying to figure out like how do these cannabinoids, if they're on these immune system cells, how do they change the way the body is, is using the immune system in the body to keep it going. The endocannabinoids are, are the biggest class of, they're cheap, protein coupled receptors, but they're the biggest class of receptors that are, dis that are found in the body right now. Major influences, that's why on the outside here you can see that it's literally influencing every other system. And of course we know that because this is what the body does, right? It's not like one way, but the fact that we have these receptors that maintain balance in the body, they're found in the brain, in the central nervous system, they're found in the immune system, and they're found in every organ in the body. So it is definitely having an effect in every area of the body. Homeostasis is balancing. So it's just balancing when things get overactive. The idea is we want to balance it and bring it back down. Or when things are really sluggish, right? They're not functioning. The idea is to bring it up. And the understanding is that the endocannabinoid system, that is its main job, is to bring homeostasis and balance back into the body. We doing okay? <laughs> okay, just checking. <laughs> so, I wanna talk about three main parts. Uh, the neuroendoimmune modulators. So neuro just means brain, right? So we're talking about the brain and how it's influencing the brain. Endo is the endocrine system, so the hormone systems of the body. 
and then immune, the immune system of the body. So when I say modulate, it's, it's, it's just it's maintaining balance and changing the way that these three areas of the body work. Oh, a quick word about the endocannabinoids. So I don't want, is, have you guys heard of Ananda, bliss, it's Sanskrit for bliss? So when they discovered the two, in dot, the ones that our body makes, so there's the THC, the CBD, the other cannabinoids, and then they discovered that we actually make these cannabinoids also. So they call them the endocannabinoids. Our body's making these. One of the ones is called anandamide. Okay, it's found in chocolate. Hello. <laughs> what happens when you eat chocolate? Yeah, really, bliss, right? <laughs> Just find the ones without a lot of sugar. Uh, it's definitely produced on meditation. So they find that your levels of anandamide rise during meditation, and it's responsible for kind of that runner's high feeling, so also higher levels of anandamide in the body uh, through these dif different uh, pathways. It acts like a neurotransmitter, and that just means a signal. So it's just a signal from the brain uh, that this anandamide has in our body. So it's signaling patterns of the brain. The second one to be discovered is this one called 2-arachidonylglycerol. So it's 2-AG for short. Uh, it influences both the CB1 and CB2 receptors. The thing about that, so 2-AG found in animal milk, all animal milk, including breast milk, so transferred from mother to child. And one of the studies showed that when they blocked the receptors for this 2-AG, the animal models, the babies stopped suckling. So it literally, everything worked, right? Everything was functional. They test all of the different functioning part of the suckling mechanism, but they lost their desire to suckle. So they call this more the motivation molecule. Right? And to think that we have these, the anandamide, the bliss, it's endogenous, we're supposed to make it, and then we have this motivation molecule, and then we look at the state of the world today, you might start, we start to ask questions like, are we not producing these enough? Right? Do we not have these high levels of endogenous anandamide and bliss molecules in our body? And why for so many years we could supplement, you know, when things got a little rough? So just, you know, I mean, I guess the idea with this is just like the endocannabinoid system, it's stimulating so many different parts of the body. The ones that are left out here, this, you know, heartless person here, <laughs> we should put a little heart in there because it does actually influence the heart as well. Um, and the other one is the skeletal, so the bones. Uh, there is an article, 2005, uh, Kaplan or something. Anyways, that uh, shows that CBD cannabidiol actually changes or influences um, the bones during fractures and breaks, so it really helps the bone actually heal a lot faster. In this country right now, uh, we know that it's illegal in sporting events, right? So you can't have any levels of any of the cannabinoids in your body, you know, if you're sporting, you know, but all these fractures that we're getting, you know, it's like at some point, hopefully, you know, once we start to wake up and really see this, you know, it might be at some point that it's going to be a part of healing these fractured bones in sporting events. That's what I'm hoping anyways. And many other things, of course. So how the heck does this work, right? All this information, nandamide and 2-AG and <laughs> the endocannabinoid system. So what's actually happening? Let's, let's try and let's see if I can get this part of it through. So what's happening is they found, so I want to talk specifically about CBD. So CBD is cannabidiol. It's, it's the non-psychoactive component of cannabis. And they used to think that CBD comes in and actually directly binds these receptors, and they've found that it doesn't bind it. CBD has a very low affinity. It doesn't want to bind these. What it does is it comes into the system, and it changes the way these receptors are binding every other part, so the neurotransmitters, the hormones. It's changing the way the cannabinoids are binding. It's up-leveling some of the receptors where it needs to be up-leveled. It's making more receptors where there's not enough activity. It's shutting down some other receptors in other parts of the body and the brain when there's, when there's too much activity. CBD is coming into the system and changing the receptors, changing the hormones. It's a main modulator. It's orchestrating, conducting this massive change back into homeostasis, into balance in the body. I'm going to talk about three main things. So that's what I was trying to say earlier. I'm going to talk about endocannabinoid tone. Still a lot of words. I hope this is okay, <laughs> but I'm, I'm, going to ex I'm going to continue to explain them. So we're going to talk about endocannabinoid tone. We're going to talk about gene transcription modulation and then brain inflammation. 
So I'll just so endocannabinoid tone. The guy to follow for endocannabinoid tone is this guy, um, Dr. Ethan Russo. So he wrote an article. It's a, it was a review back in 2004, or 2000, yeah, 2004, and he's maybe a month away from from the next one. Uh, 14 years later, right? So. He has a lot of really great information about what this means. Like he says that we have every human has like this baseline of endocannabinoids. So tone just means like, you know, is there too much? You know, is it like screaming or is it like you can't hear it? Like there's not enough, right? So he's saying we every human we don't know how much you know and who has a lot and who doesn't have enough. There's no way of actually testing it. But his theory and it is a theory, but really awesome theory is that that maybe this tone is out of balance. Right? And, and, and then a lot of times really deficient. Like there's not, like we're not hearing, you know, our own endocannabinoids anymore. And he's termed the coin, he's coined the term clinical endocannabinoid deficiency, meaning there's just not enough. And what happens, and, and what a lot of the studies are showing is when you don't have the higher levels of the 2AG and the anandamide, a lot of thresholds are lowered. So we know this in seizures for sure, right? So Charlotte's Web. Has everyone seen the movie Weed, W-E-E-D, Dr. Sanja Gupta? It's a, it's a documentary. And a lot of the work coming from that and the studies out of Israel with Raphael Meshulam is understanding that when the levels are low of our endogenous cannabinoids, we lower the, the pain threshold lowers, seizure thresholds lower. A lot of different things are lowered in the body. He's studying and looking at specifically migraines, <clears throat> fibromyalgia, and irritable bowel. So really good information there. But what's happening is when CBD comes into the body, the really cool thing it does is the very first thing it does is it, it heightens the levels of 2-AG in the body. So it goes right after the 2-AG pathways and turns on our own ability to do this mechanism the way it's been designed to do it. And it breaks, it stops the breakdown of anandamide. So it doesn't actually turn on anandamide but it stops the breakdown of anandamide, so you start to get this nice pooling of anandamide if you eat chocolate and meditate or other things that excite the anandamide levels. <laughs> but the idea is that, so the 2-AG, this is, so CBD comes into the system and heightens it, it turns it on, and then it goes and does the other stuff, but it's immediately allowing our body to work better. So there's a lot of talk and a lot of research around the idea of like addictions, you know, with different uh, uh, cannabis forms of, of getting cannabis in your body and like is it addictive but they're showing it's like it's it's not typically addictive in the sense that it's physiologically addicted addictive but because the first thing it's doing is making your body work better you you don't require more of it it wants more 2-ag and more anandamide your endogenous system starts working a lot better so he has some really good information around cbd this um can be confusing so you don't have to read all that <laughs> Um, genes, so genes are a blueprint, right? We know, so we have our cells, right? And then we have the nucleus inside, and then inside the nucleus we have genes. And when we need something to happen, the genes will, they'll unwind and they'll expose like different gene sequences, right? And some protein comes in and it looks for the region that it's, you know, trying to build a protein or something, and then it reads it and then close it up, closes it back up. But genes on their own don't do anything, right? So they're, they have to be read, and that's what transcription is. So genes being read, and then modulation, what this study showed right here is how CBD is modulating or deciding or changing the way some of these genes are being read. The big question that it was asking is, I don't know if you guys have heard this, this question comes up for me a lot, I heard you have to have THC, you know, in order for CBD to work or to function. And that's what this article was actually trying to uh, answer that question. And what they found, before we talk about how cool it is with the gene transcription, you know, reading spe specific genes, um, 680 gene pathways were upregulated or turned on with CBD alone, no THC. Right? So this is CBD on its own versus 58 pathways that were turned on for THC. So THC is not needed to make these major changes in the body. The other thing that it did, 524, it turned off. CBD gets into the body and it turns off. And the main ones that it's turning off 
is your pro-inflammatory cytokine, so it's shutting down the main inflammation pathways in the body. The main ones that it was turning on, the 680 different gene expression pathways that it was turning on, was your antioxidant pathways. So allowing your body to start functioning and cleaning and clearing up. Pretty fabulous. So much broader effect CBD than THC. That's why I like talking about it. I'm not saying that, I mean, I, I obviously, like, I had to use THC with my mom, and, and we like THC, right? But the idea of, like, thinking that you need THC is, is incorrect. We use it, you know, to, you know, to get the lowest influence that your body needs. Do you have a question? Sorry, I don't know if we're allowed to ask questions, but the endocannabinoids, how and where are they made in the body? They're made on, it, ba mostly, oh, yeah. So, thank you. So, sh she was asking where the endocannabinoids are made in the body, and they're made in the brain. They're made in the brain, they're made on demand, and they don't stay very long in the brain, but they're made on demand, have immediate influence, and they're typically broken down pretty quick. They're made in, in, in the brain, different areas of the brain. If, if you want to have a question, uh, just have them raise your hand and I'll get a microphone to them. Okay. So this, is, so this is what it's showing. That, so what CBD is doing, it's coming into the, bot, into the body and it's saying, what do we need to change? What do we need to regulate? Turning on pathways and turning on, off pathways. On its own is this main conducting system. The other thing is that the 2AG, the endogenous one, works very similar to C CBD. So the, so the more CBD you take, the more you start to bring your body into balance, the less you actually need. Your body doesn't need it, so it just, it just and we're paying a high premium <laughs> for CBD in this country, so it's really important to pay attention to your symptoms because typically what I'm noticing is a lot of these symptoms start to even out. They start to balance out. That's what happened with my mother anyways. Does, does that make sense? Here's a question over here. Hi. I have a question about the glutathione. Do you mean yeah. um, the glutathione system strongly upregulated or unregulated? Like, can you talk more about that? Because I'm very interested. Yeah, yeah, that's a really great question. We love glutathione. <laughs> yes, we do. <laughs> so glutathione has, in order to get glutathione and all of the different pathways, you have to turn on somewhere around three to 400 different expressions of genes, right? So little sequences of genes so that you can get all the enzymes, you can get the proteins, you can get the, all, all the different things that it takes to, to, to make that pathway function. And one of the things that we're starting to understand a little bit now more is if, you, if you're familiar with the NRF2, that's the main one, right? That's the main one that can come in and it just turns on all of those pathways for you. What CBD does is it's coming in, it's igniting that NRF2 pathway. So it's doing it through turning on, helping NRF2, and turning on all the expressions and doing a few of them on their own also. So, what it's, so it's, it's basically just upregulating the ability of our bodies to make glutathione and to, and to make it efficient in the body also. That's a really great article. I think everyone should actually pick this up and read it. It's a really fantastic article. We have another. Is that a typo on your slide then? Because it says unregulated. Do you mean to say upregulated? That should say upregulated. Thank you. Yes. OK, got it. Yeah, that is a typo. Thank you. Can you write that down for me so I can change that? <laughs> Thank you. It's, it's going to upregulate it in a very beautiful, beautiful way. Um, that was your question. Okay, and then again, downregulating all of our inflammatory pathways. So again, trying to bring the body back into balance. Really great article. Oh, you said the article is called, it's the one at the top. It's out of the British Journal of Pharmacology. I want to say this is a nine, ah, like a 90, it's a 2004. It's a 2004 out of the British Journal of Pharmacopoeia, and it's called Differential Transcription Profiles mediated by exposure to the cannabinoids, cannabidiol, delta-9 THC, CV2 microglial cells, brain stuff also. How are we doing on time? Doing okay? Okay. <laughs> Anybody watch the movie 
um, concussion? Will Smith? If you haven't seen it, watch it. I, tr I tried not to watch it, but I knew that I had to. <laughs> I learned about concussions in chiropractic school and what it's doing to the brain. And I also love football. I love football, but I haven't watched, maybe I watched two games, but I haven't watched very many games since I watched that movie. I can't support it. <laughs> can't support it. It's one of my favorite games. So the, the movie Will Smith, they're talking about the young football players, you know, that have a career lifespan of about, you know, three to six years. And then they get tossed out, and, and they have zero support. So it was following one kid in particular, a couple kids in particular, and Will Smith was the physician in this, and he was really advocating. And he's the one that found out the traumatic, traumat, chronic traumatic encephalitis, so pretty much brain inflammation. Um, definitely watch it. It's, it'll be worth your time and hard to support that game that I love so much. Actually, here's a, I'm coming back to that. Here's a follow-up to that. So this is... a. 2017, so July 2017, there was a follow-up, uh, and this was JAMA, Journal of American Medical Association. The, they were studying, this was a follow-up, so they studied 202 deceased football players. It was a, a brain donation study, so these deceased football players uh, donated their brains, and of those 202 players, 177, so 87% of them showed some sign of brain injury, brain damage. And 110 of them were former NFL players. So all the other ones, the ones that weren't NFL players, they were, you know, some little, like the little ones, and then some high school, some recreational, you know, just under the National Football League. And then the other 100 were the National Football League. And of the former NFL, of course, 99% of them showed signs of chromatic, so brain injury, basically. So these are, there's few criticisms with this article, but still very telling, you know, still looking at this information, you know, you can formulate uh, your own ideas about that. But mood and behavior, cognitive dysfunction, dysmension, you know, what happens with the brain inflammation, it starts slow sometimes. Now, we don't even know that it's happening sometimes, you know, it starts with like mood behaviors and I don't feel good and I have like brain fog and, you know, some kind of like, like I'm just angry and I don't know what to do about it, you know, and it goes all the way through just like this really traumatic, fiery, behavior that happens all the way through in dementia and suicide. So really important to look at some of that stuff. But the reason I bring that up anyways uh, is because you don't have to be an NFL player to experience this. A lot of these studies showing, anybody here ever been exposed to mercury? Yeah. <laughs> uh, anyone here? I'm from Santa Cruz, so I always whisper this. Like, you don't have to tell me if you did, but anybody here doesn't eat organic all the time. Don't, I don't, I don't want to see it. <laughs> Glyphosate is Monsanto, right? So it's our, it's our roundup. Um, a lot of mold toxins, a lot of limes, you know, on the East Coast coming over the West Coast and everywhere in between. Anybody here have a cell phone or use the internet? Hmm. <laughs> so a lot of exposures, a lot of different exposures, right? Dysbiotic toxins is just an imbalance in our microbiome. Uh, that's why we talk a lot about inflammation in the gut. So let's see if I can explain what's happening here. So on this side over here, this is a, a, this is a brain cell. It's a microglia. Over here is a, is a nerve cell. So what happens is these triggers, with trying to keep it as simple as we can, we get these exposures. We have these triggers. And what they do is they come in and they trigger that microglia. And what it does is that cell then goes in and it starts sending out all of these signals to the neuron. And it excites it. This is involved in the, the glutamate receptors are part of this. So it excites it, excites it. You guys read a taste, what is it, the taste that kills? What was his name? Taste that kills. This is where I first started learning about excitotoxins. Toxins. But anyways, MSG. But anyways, um, it comes in, it excites these glutamate receptors, and then the, and then the, cell, the brain cell dies, right? Because it can't stand it. It can't handle that much excitement. And it's a lot of the toxicity, but when this brain cell dies, it then releases all of these other chemicals, and it triggers that, uh, this, this microglia over here. It tr triggers inflammation in there. And then you just get this cycle that happens. It's continuous. It goes on and on and on and on. And before you know it, we have a brain on fire, right? And some, leave, some people, it's very low level. And for some people, it's very high level. 
right? And then there's everything in between. The information is that CBD, a lot of the articles, I can send you some of these articles also. If you guys want some of these, I don't cite them because, because it gets really confusing. There's a lot of words on the screen and we can't focus on it. But if anybody wants these articles, they're so brilliant. They're so great. So if you like reading these, I'm happy to send you a list of them. I have a, a paper over here. You can just put your email on there and tell me you, know, you want more information, whatever it is, or just the, the slide presentation or just the, the, the articles themselves and I'm happy to send it to you. But really great information how CBD is coming in and quieting down these glutamate receptors. It's shutting down glutamate, the, excito, the, the excitability of these glutamate receptors, and at the same time shutting off the, this chronic inflammatory response. Again, upregulating how many 540 or 504 different pathways and shutting down another 300. It's shutting down all this pro-inflammatory process, not just systemically, but also in our brain. So quieting the brain, bringing the brain back into balance so we can think a little bit clearer, mental clarity, you know, so we can behave sometimes even a little bit better, so we can think about the way we're behaving, you know, <laughs> what's it going to take, but, but just really trying to bring like a, like that that anxiety that sometimes is kind of low level and sometimes really high, just trying to bring that into balance. We're good? Okay, <laughs> I'm gonna move on. So the main three things I, that I found, I keep hitting the mic, sorry. The main three things that I think that are, that are fascinating and interesting to me is the endocannabinoid tone. Right? So really changing the way our body's using our own endocannabinoids, bringing that back into balance. The second one is the way it's changing genes, the expression of genes in our body. It's a lot of work around cancer and changing the, the, the way that cancer is expressed also. Um, and, then sh and then quieting the inflammation in the brain. So three main things. And then we, we, it goes on and on and on from there. So without getting too boring, oh, that's that one. I'm just going to touch on some of these. And again, if you want the articles on these, I'm happy to send them to you. But a lot of work in GI and digestion. We know that CBD, 2-AG, not so much anandamide or somewhat THC also, but it's really involved with motility. It's the propulsion, you know, trying to get that food and all of, the, all of that motility going through. So, so a lot of work around that, you know, and secretions, you know, modulating appetite. We know that THC is a huge conductor of that, right? So we, very useful in, in cancer treatment, anorexia, eating disorders, reduction of nausea. I took this with my aunt, um, my dear sweet aunt, Norma Wright. Uh, she had stage four cancer by the time I found out. Uh, and this was about three months ago. And I took, uh, we're on camera. <laughs> well, anyways, I took her somewhere wherever she is. <laughs> uh, somewhere where it was not legal. Because I, I, she was just to the stage where she wasn't eating, and I know the way that it influences the body, and I know that there's people all over the world right now that, you know, that could that could use this. And right now it's in synthetic form, so she was given, uh, uh, dronabinol, and it's called just high, high THC. It made her so sick, it made her so sick. So CBD, the beautiful thing about CBD is again because it's a main modulator. Oh, this is something that you guys could know. Just reminded me. If you happen to take too much THC, I don't know if that's ever happened to anyone in this room. <laughs> it doesn't feel good, right? <laughs> CBD as a main modulator will come into the system and it'll pluck the THC off of those CB1 receptors in your brain that the psychosis, the psychoactivity plucks it off, right? And it shuffles it, shuttles it over to your CB2 receptors, so more peripheral and organ systems, so you get more of a therapeutic effect and less of a psychoactive effect. And that's what it's doing for, again, like all of these different systems, the neurotransmitters, the hormones, like wherever it's needed, it'll do that. So if you ever happen to get too high and you don't like it, just add some CBD and bring that calming back down so you don't feel like this psychotic, like impending doom. <laughs> this is really good for teenagers, you know, for, for parents of teenagers to have some CBD on hand, right? <laughs> because those poor little fellows are so inexperienced. <laughs> I mean, that would have been me, so inexperienced. And now the levels of THC, I mean, everything in this country and the world is bred for high levels of THC. We've lost so much of our, our plant source, the plant that had you know, a nice balance of the CBD and THC. 
and it's so bred right now for high levels of THC. So we do have to be very careful about what cannabis we're, we're using, especially the, well, not especially, but everyone, but I think about the young ones because I've heard some horror stories. Anyways, okay, so Crohn's, obesity, diabetes is a lot of work. Liver, again, this comes from that study, the one that I said everyone should read, and I say that about every study I come across, actually, but <laughs> that one with the gene transcription. So some of the really cool things they're showing is that it's actually changing, so some of the scarring in the liver, it's changing that fibrosis in the liver. So the, I, I can't fully remember what this it was on mice, and they induced, like they gave them a whole bunch of ethanol, these poor little our poor little mice, it's hard to read some of these studies, but it gives us really great information. Um, and it just literally turned around these pathways, these pathologies in the liver. Again, turning on, and one of the main reasons is because it's the glutathione that's activated. They're really clearing out all of the toxins so that the liver can actually function a lot better. Pain management. I think this is probably why it's so well known right now. Also the seizures, so Charlotte's Web, you guys have to take a look at that documentary weed. Um, but also pain management, you know, this is why I got so uh, involved in this. You know, and we have an epidemic right now, and we all know that. We have a very, very big opioid epidemic. What are we gonna do about that? You know, they're starting to crack down on, uh, on the distribution of opioids, but they don't, they don't give our people another alternative. It's just cutting and cutting and cutting and cutting, cutting it back, which I think is really important, but where's the alternative? Like how can we help you know, people who are actually in pain and probably going to be in pain for the rest of their lives? Don't just take away the opioids. You gotta give them an alternative, right? So again, these receptors, the CB1 receptors, you know, CBD and THC is influencing on a very large scale all of the nociceptors. So that's the pain areas of the brain. And it's involved in so many different areas in the spinal cord and the thalamus. There's all these different areas that are, that, are, that are influenced. So we change not only just the perception of pain, so changing the way that brain is perceiving pain, but actually changing the pathways themselves from many different levels, not just cutting into one pathway. We're not just breaking one pathway. We're changing all of the different pathways in the body, many of them. This study, really good, Martin, 1996. I did put that one in there because I thought it was fabulous. When they studied the diff the, this area, the ventral-postolateral part of the thalamus, they found that CBD was tenfold more potent than morphine on a very large scale. And this is a great implication. We can use these together. CBD ch changes the way that opioids are, are processed in the body. It actually makes them work better. This is why it works so good for my mom. This is why I was able to start taping her off of these opioids because the CBD was and the THC was changing all of these expressions in her body, but her opioids were working better. She didn't need them, so we started tapering those off also. And her depression and anxiety and blood pressure, like so many different ones also. Really good for nerve pain, you guys. Really, really good for nerve pain. Mental health. So when your body perceives fear, yeah, uh, question over here. Well, I'll yell. OK. Uh, I can repeat pain it. Management or anything like that. So the question is, how should you know the dose management for whatever the condition is or issue? So I'm gonna I'm gonna hang on to that question. I do want to answer that, uh, and I want to do it at, at the end for for that particular question because that's very complicated, unfortunately. <laughs> and actually, and maybe not. So it just it just depends on who on who you are. So the mental health part of it, when your body perceives fear, the, the amygdala, this is one of the centers of the brain that produces anandamide, the levels of anandamide drop in your body. And then when the levels of anandamide drop in your body, your perception, it triggers, one, the sympathetic nervous system, and it's very hard to get out of that chronic, you know, sympathetic-driven state. They say sympathetic state, you know, when you start triggering the pathways like we saw in the neuroinflammatory pathways, the, the inflammation in the brain, same thing with our sympathetic system. It's like constantly having, you know, your foot on the gas and out the brake at the same time. You're just 
we're trying to get somewhere, you're not moving for anywhere, but you're just constantly revved and revved and revved. This is chronic sympathetic driven bodies. And when we're experiencing fear or anxiety or stress, our anandamide levels drop. That's why meditation is so good. You bring those levels right back up. But now we're in the cycle and it triggers fear responses. It triggers our ability to forget even. So we're constantly recycling that. Anandamide, anandamide in the brain allows you, it changes your short-term memory, so you're not recycling over and over again, especially areas that, things, uh, events that cause fear. A lot of work around, so PTSD, this was, this reminds me again of Dr. Sanjay Gupta, so that documentary that he did, he did three of them. The second one, they talked a lot about PTSD, so our vets that are coming home for more uh, and doing some research around how it's really helping them deal with some of this PTSD and, and a lot of other triggers um, that's happening for our, you know, for our vets. Schizophrenia, I put that one on there. Um, that one's a difficult one, again, because of the THC, you know, because of the THC in particular, and sometimes even the CBD. So that's, there, there's a lot of studies around that, but it's, it's not so straight and narrow, and, and neither is anything, really. <laughs> Opiate withdrawal, alcoholism, again, because we're changing the, the, the rewards pathway in the brain. Um, and anxiety, so good, just leveling, quieting the brain. So we're not so fearful and, and anxious all the time. Brain health, neurogenesis and brain plasticity. We were told for years we thought we would never be able to generate new brain cells. <laughs> That's not true. We certainly can regenerate new brain cells, new pathways to the brain. A lot of work around Alzheimer's. A lot of work around Alzheimer's, really good stuff. Also, I'm following, you know, Thomas Seyfried, who I'm super excited that's coming in June, and, you know, following the metabolic theories also, you know, the, the changing, yes? Can you expand a little bit more on the, on the Alzheimer's and the effectiveness of it? I, I don't, all I can s say right now about Alzheimer's is they're, they're trying to change, they're looking at the way, one, the plaques, but two, um, there's a very specific pathway that they're looking at. Let me, let me get you the studies because I can't, I can't fully remember what the different pathways are. Um, but I, I think part of it is, is the inflammation, but there's very particular pathways, but they're looking specifically at all the inflammation, that cyclic infl inflammation in the brain. So if we can turn off the inflammation in the brain, we can change a lot of the neurodegenerative diseases. Parkinson's, my aunt has been diagnosed with Parkinson's. She's in Utah, and I took her some CBD, you know, and she went to her neurosurgeon and asked her neurosurgeon if she should be taking that, and he said no. I made a special trip out there, but guess what? My grandma's taking it. <laughs> She's 92 years old, and uh, my other aunt is taking it, so it was, it was successful in that sense, and I'm hoping that eventually she'll, get, she'll, you know, she'll give it a try. No THC in that one, just CBD, because it is Utah. Um, Seizure disorders, of course, changing serotonin and dopamine, the neuroprotective pathways of the brain. A lot of brain health stuff. This is where I can talk about some of this, about your question. The delivery methods, oh, it can get so confusing. I mean, it used to be so easy, right? You just smoke some. <laughs> How easy is that? <laughs> Just take a little hit, see if it works. <laughs> if it gets you too high, you go to sleep maybe, or you run around. The thing is, is because it's changed so much, I'm, I'm kind of, I'm having a hard time with, you know, the legalization, of course, because, because it's changing everything, but I think it's so important also the regulation, like we need regulation, but the reason we're having to have this regulation now is because all of our plans have changed. They've just been bred for this high THC content, so it's hard to find strains that haven't been changed that have high CBD content. They are available, but they're very hard to find in their natural state. So we have to start changing some of the, or modifying some of these genes, unless we're using hemp, of course, uh, to, to get the CBD high levels of CBD. So yeah, of course you can inhale, you can smoke it, you can vape it. There's a, you know, we, I don't know how much we want to be putting, you know, smoke in, into our lungs, you know, at some point. You know, that's why the tinctures are available. And in the early 1900s, they were tinctures. 
you know, I'm sure they have been throughout history for a very long time also. So you can extract the oil and, and get some of the tincture out of there. Nanotechnology, you know, some of the guys around here that are doing glutathione, guys and gals that are doing the glutathione nano. Nano is a, it's also in a tincture form, but they take uh, a little liposome that has a, a the phospho-bilayer, and it, it just, it, it pretty much, they make it super, super small. So nano is a unit in size. They make it super, super small. They take the CBD or your cannabinoids or whatever you need, and they put it into this little liposome, and then it can diffuse through the mucosal membranes, whether it's the oral mucosa or going down through the throat and the stomach. Like, it's just, you get so much more in in that way. Uh, Quicksilver does a lot of that. Tinctures, of course, you know, in alcohol-based uh, forms. Ingested. <laughs> I never gave one of these to my mom <laughs> because, I, because it has sometimes like this double effect, right? Because it changes as you're breaking down THC in your system. I think the liver converts it to a second form of THC, and I can't remember what it is. It's like delta-8 or something THC, but then it gives you a second kick. So you've heard of people who've like taken their brownie, and they're like two hours later, they're like, nothing's happening. So they take a little bit more, and all of a sudden it's like, bam! <laughs> you know? And it lasts 12, 16 you know, hours. That's why you have your CBD on hand. You offset that, right? <laughs> Topical. There's CB1 and CB2 receptors in our skin. There's a lot of studies around acne and um, skin dermatitis. I have a little mole back here, and I'm testing it on this one. You know, and it's actually, and it's just a, it's just a. A balm that I have, it has THC and CBD in it, and it's getting smaller and smaller. I have a colleague and friend who had this really big <laughs> mole, I mean, it was, and it had like molds underneath it. I should ask her exactly what it is. And she's been rubbing some THC CBD balm, and it's gone. And that's why I decided I wanted to try it on this, because with the CB1 receptors and CB2 receptors in the skin, uh, absorb it really rapidly. It doesn't get into your bloodstream, so it works on a very you know, superficial la layer. So maybe some of it's absorbed, but not very much. That's why you can take C THC and rub it on your skin and don't have to worry about getting blood tested. And it's not going to get into your blood that quick or really that efficiently. It's just going to work on a, on a level. So topicals are really, really great. Transdermal patches, they last a little longer, 8 to 12 hours. The ones that I use for my mom, I put them on the inside of her ankle and sometimes on her wrist. Uh, and we'd leave them there for about 12 hours. I use different ratios. So a lot of different ways to get it in. It gets really confusing. As far as, our, as, far as dosing, it, it's hard to know. I, the way I did it, I can only tell you the way I did it with my mom. Uh, and I started, I started very, what I thought was very low. <laughs> THC. She's never, she's never taken THC. She never had alcohol, but she had a lot of drugs. Right? So I didn't know how this was going to influence her. But we started really low. I started with like a one-to-one -one ratio of CBD THC. I only used the tinctures for her and the transdermal patches. And now I use topical. But, but when I first started with her, we were just using the tinctures. And the idea is to start low and titrate up with both CBD and THC because you don't know how your body's going to react to it. Um, you don't know how much you need, and there's no sense in taking more than what you need. Even with CBD, it doesn't have a psychoactive component, but it's so expensive. <laughs> you don't, you know, if you tight, if you start really low and then just move your, you know, wait half a day, or just depend on what your condition is. Like if you need some pretty immediate pain with relief, like with her, I was trying like every two hours and trying to get it in between of, you know, her, her own medications. Never at the same time, because I didn't know. Um, but I, I want to say I started with like a one-to-one -one ration. I was doing like one drop. Like one drop under the tongue. They have the little rubber things, you know, and I'd see how she fell. I also had a straight THC tincture that was pretty much all THC, and then I had a, a CBD. And so it, it, it's... Basically, the idea is you start slow and you work your way up, and you wait till you see some kind of uh, effect with it. Um, what I keep hearing is that people who experience anxiety are the, f that's one of the quickest, you know, I mean, within an hour, you know, or less. 
So if you are someone with anxiety, you can try that. And what I hear a lot of people say, like, I tried CBD and it doesn't work. I tried that, it doesn't work. You didn't get enough, I think. You didn't get enough. So some people are gonna, some of the people that I work with, again, I can't give you advice on like how to do it, but I'll just tell you, some of the people that I work with, I have them start with just a little bit, and then they, some people are taking, you know, I'm gonna call them pumps of CBD, and they might need eight pumps, you know, in, in, in the first four hours of their morning. You know, I have other people that might do two pumps. And, and I'm telling these people that have to have or are using high amounts of it to do that for, you know, try it for an extended period of time and then try and bring yourself down off of it, you know. The idea is the body, we're hoping the body eventually will catch on. There's a sweet spot with THC. There's just a sweet spot. If you don't, if you want to use THC medicinally and not get high off of THC, for some people that's part of the medicine. Right? But for some people, if you want to be very functional, then the idea is to start really, really low, a couple of milligrams, you know, and then and, and depending on how you're ingesting it, how you're getting it, um, you know, then maybe, you know, four hours later or six hours later, you try a little bit more. But when CBD doesn't, specifically CBD, when you say it doesn't work, I say take more. You know, find a dose that actually works for you. Is that helpful? So <laughs> Mm -hmm. So surprised you say you started with a one-to-one. -one. I went to the dispensary for the first time before my back surgery, and the mm -hmm. woman there said, oh, we have this 25 CBD to 1 THC thing, and that's what you should use yeah. because you don't want to get high. You just want the anti-inflammatory. So if you're trying to deal with the pain or inflammation, why would you not go to a... Like a lower... Uh, a, a very low THC, yeah. very high CBD ratio. I did it for s several reasons. I, I did get my mom high <laughs> quite a few times <laughs> by accident. I didn't mean to, but she went flying. <laughs> I think that was part of her therapy, but I didn't mean to do that. The reason I had the, the pure CBD is so that I could try and offset a little bit. So I started with the one-to-one -one because she had high amounts of pain really high amounts of pain. Um, and she had nerve pain. She had a lot, of, a lot of her pain was not just inflammation, but was also nerve pain. So I, I was going, I was told by some of the people that are trying to help me that in order to try and settle down the, specifically her nerve pain was to, was to administer some THC because that's going to help way more than just the CBD. The CBD is going to help with inflammation. THC in particular is going to help with nerve pain. So that's why I started with the one-to-one -one with her is so that I could try and get some of that nerve pain. And when I sent her flying, I didn't know about the CBD, <laughs> but I did. I would just give her a little bit more of the CBD because I thought it would just dilute it, is what I was thinking. But it turns out it actually plucks it off. But yeah, and, and, and it, was, it was a game. Like I, there, there's, there's no handbook right now, unfortunately. There's no handbook. But I would say, yeah, I mean, over and over again, like every expert that I've listened to and talked to in red, they say, just start low. And for me, that was low, I thought, for her. Um, and it worked well for her. But she had a lot of nerve pain also. And eventually, we, don't, we didn't need that much. You know, she doesn't do a lot of one-to-one -one now. She does a lot of CBD. All right. Are we almost there? I'm going to... About I'm seven gonna, minutes. Seven minutes, and OK. And then five minutes of questions, or if you want to do questions. <laughs> Okay, where'd you go? <laughs> okay, <laughs> who's talking to me? <laughs> I'm like that bitmoji. What the? <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> All right. So I do want to talk about caution, ca cautions and contraindications. Um, the pleasant I threw some of these in today, so the slides aren't. This is, I kind of messed up this sl slide a lot, but yeah, you know, you know, the cautions for pleasant sensations, you know, mild euphoria. This is very therapeutic for some people, right? You know, relaxation, enhanced sensory output, really great for a lot of people. But sometimes, you know, we have to remember that yeah, you can get some unpleasant, especially if we're doing, you know, different levels of THC. CBD doesn't typically cause psychoactive. Um, unpleasantries, right? Because it's, it's working on so many different parts of the body and it's not actually binding those receptors that are in the brain. Um, 
But there is some, you know, people, people have reported that they, you know, they do experience heightened anxiety. So you have to watch for this, you know, with, with, with your different ratios and tinctures, disorientation, paranoia, psychosis. This is why my aunt wouldn't, one who passed from cancer, she wouldn't continue because she was given the dronabinol and it sent her flying. She never touched it again. So, and when you've felt that, typically, you know, we lose people there because they're afraid to try it again. Even just the straight CBD, she was just really afraid. So that's why I say make sure you have plenty of CBD on hand. You know, slurred speech, dizziness, impaired balance, dry mouth, of course, hunger, you get the munchies, right? For some people that's very therapeutic, for some people they don't want that. So it's just good to know some of these things also. Adolescent use. You know, the young ones, especially when they're doing higher levels of THC, there is some studies that are coming out that are showing that it is changing the brain, the way that the brain functions. So we have to be careful with the young ones. Not so much CBD, but more, more the THC, you know, the plant, the, the smoking in particular. So this isn't my specialty. I don't know the laws very well, but I thought I'd throw these slides in. So I'm just going to go through them really quick <laughs> because, I, I, again, I, this is stuff that we'll have to look on the Internet because I don't know it very well, and then I'll open it up for questions. You know, but as of January 2018, half of the states in the United, half of the states in the U.S. have legalized either medicinally or recreationally. Um, so definitely a lot more awareness, right? A lot more awareness. It is still a Schedule One. So cannabis is still, medical marijuana is still scheduled as a Schedule One um, by the U.S. government. And what that means is it's a drug or substance that has a high potential for abuse. It has no currently accepted medical use in treatment in the United States. Um, a, a drug or substance which is unsafe for use under medical supervision. So it's still legal, federally scheduled as a Schedule One. Let me show you that, though. <laughs> Again, I'm not trying to, like, I'll let you guys do whatever you want with this information. Um, but the U.S. government has a federal patent on CBD. Did you guys know that? The U.S. government has a federal patent on the use of CBD specifically as an antioxidant. So hello, upregulating all of our antioxidant pathways. We know this. And as a neuroprotectant, so quieting the brain. We know that it's very protective for the brain and it's very good for clearing the body, all these antioxidant pathways. And here we have a U.S. government that has a patent, but still schedule one drug. So. I'll let you play with that information. California law, you know, we passed uh, with the um, Compassionate Use Act in 1996 for use as medical cannabis, and then of course, um, January, as of January 1st this year, it is also recreational. Uh, so what does it mean for recreational marijuana use? I wrote these things down. So adults 21 and over can buy up to one ounce of cannabis. This is if you don't have a medical marijuana card. If you have a medical marijuana card, it's the same as before, you can go in and get I don't know what the limit is, but I, or there might not be a limit. I've gotten a lot of it. Um, but, if you, but if you're using it recreationally, you can get up to one ounce. Um, and you can only get it from the dispensaries. You need a valid ID or license. Really interesting, the cash system. A lot of the banks still won't, won't use CBD money. I sold a bottle. My, my, my friend, colleague, sold a bottle through... I think it was PayPal or Square or one of these merchants, these online merchants, they took her account because just because it said CBD oil on it. And it's happening all the place. So banks around the United States still aren't doing it. I think some of these major companies have to go to Mexico and you know, other, other countries because the U.S. banks won't recognize it. So when you go to the dispensary, they typically will require some kind of cash or you can use your debit card, but they run it in a funny way and they give you back change. It's kind of, kind of strange. But you know, hopefully this will all be changing. Just a little bit of pretty colors for you here. You know, <laughs> it's a lot of talk, a lot of information. You know, some of it seems kind of depressing, but yet it's super exciting because all of you guys are here tonight. You know, and we are understanding this more. You know, there's so much more interest in cannabis. You know, in use medicinally and where it's going. So I super appreciate everyone being here, and I do hope that you learned something. Um, you can see in here. This is from Leafly. They're also a really, really good resource for you. 
But even just here, you know, there's pain and sleep, gastrointestinal, mood and behavior, neurological, and other. These are some of the areas that are being studied. Of course, so many more other areas are being studied, more outside of the United States than in the United States, and I'm hoping that'll change. You know, but even on the outside out here, you know, there's migraines, headaches, cramps, sleep apnea, cancers, ALS. I didn't even talk about cancer, but there's so much research on cancer. Multiple sclerosis, depression, PTSD. You guys, in, in the center there, it is, you know, all the different cannabinoids that are being studied. And that's a short list. It's not complete by any means. You know, so there is definitely this synergistic effect that happens when you have your plant medicine, the whole plant itself, because it works synergistically with all the other different cannabinoids, the terpenes and the flavonoids. So just some pretty stuff there for you to look at, a lot of information. Um, Here's my disclaimer, <laughs> I have to say it, right? You know, this is educational. I really do hope that you learned something from this. If you have questions, we're gonna do questions, I guess, for a few more yep. minutes. We'll have um, about five minutes for questions. Okay. But I get the first one. Who's the best dealer in town? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> what brands do you recommend? Are they all about the same quality? There's a lot of conferences, there's a lot of CBD peddlers, and what's what? Um, that's, I, that's a tough question. Because there's so many right now, there's so many different products available out there. I try to do my best to study them. I really like the nanotechnology. I like Quicksilver. I like, you know, some of, like, Prime My Body. I think Prime My, yeah. And, and the reason that I like that one is, again, because we're paying such a high premium right now for CBD in this country. And what I have learned this is the one that I have my mom on specifically for CBD is because, um, because, she, because it's so efficient to get into the body, she needs a lot less. So the absorption rate between nanotechnology and your regular tinctures, is the difference is like 6%, 6 to 10% versus like 95 plus absorption. So is that Quicksilver? Quicksilver or Prime My Body. Yeah. If it's prime. prime of my body. Yeah. P R I M E, my body. I'm I'm super happy to send anybody information on those on some of my favorite ones. Those are my favorite ones, but not everyone, like we have to find one that works with people. So I try different ones, but I really do like that one. And I'm happy to send you guys very specific information on some of these products. If you leave your email here with me, then I can send you all that information so you can try some of these, you know, and see how they work for you, see how they work for their family members. What I'm noticing is that people come to these events because it's either themselves or somebody that they really, really care about. And this is, you know, I'm, I'm coming from the heart. You know, so I really am coming to share good information, and I've been doing my own research to find out, you know, which ones work. And my mom, she's such a sweet, 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 sweet little lady. She allows me to try these on her because she's, she gives me this information. She is struggling. She is struggling, you know, and, and, and she's one of my most important people on this planet. So I use some of this information, and she gives it back to me, but she, but because I don't, I'm, I feel good. So it does, like, I'm just like, yeah, you know, that, that's great. But I get a really good feedback from my mother. So I'm happy to continue to share this information and everything that I've learned and send you information if you leave me your email. And I can send you all that information on the Prime My Body and the Quicksilver and some of the other ones that I really like. Um, there have been some studies that have observed that in the states that have medical marijuana, Medicaid costs are significantly lower, especially for pain medication. Just comment. I'm, I'm glad that you said that. And I'm not surprised. Yeah. Absolutely. I mean, we could really change the way that this country is run, you know, but of course there's a lot of, that's, <laughs> we could talk about that for a long time. <laughs> it is changing. Things are changing. We're going in the right direction. I love Prime My Body. That's my favorite one. I absolutely love it. I am, I'm a personal trainer and I have all my clients take it because all, all my clients are stressed or commuting. Yeah. But another thing I use the um, CBD for is I've been giving it to my dog. Yeah. And I have a French bulldog. He's a bomb. Yeah. But he gets a little crazy and he gets a little yeah. anxious sometimes, like when we're not together. Mm -hmm. And I, I feel like it's been really helping him out and it makes him eat better. And yeah. I mean, he's been putting on weight. And it's yeah. also, um, I don't, you, you didn't really talk about it, but it's also really good for kids. I know yeah. a lot of my 
My friends mm -hmm. who have crazy kids have Absolutely. been giving them a little bit of the CBD mm -hmm. and it's night and day, especially mm -hmm. for the boys who are mm -hmm. just running around. But yeah, I think that's something really important to be talking about as well for animals too. And for seniors, for senior pets. Thank you. Absolutely. So my, my, pup, my sweet little snowball, she was a Westie, 15 years old. She just passed in December. Um, but she started with the limping and like, and, and I, I give both of my dogs, I have two Westies, had two Westies, I have one now, but I've been giving them CBD also and they respond. Again, everything above an insect has these receptors. Right, so all chordates, everything with the vertebra has these receptors, so it can influence them as well. Um, Prime my body, and a lot of these CBD, depending on the amount of THC, they are approved for infants, babies. Two AG is is passed from the mother to child through through breast milk. We're working on the receptors, working on the way the body works. You know, so if you do high levels of CBD no THC, we can influence the way our kids are experiencing life right now because a lot of those factors that I was showing you about the brain inflammation, they're all involved in that. So really good. I have a lot of kids, a lot of my, you know, between six and 16 on CBD products and it's incredibly safe. Should we look for organic? Yes, or I think so. So coffee, <laughs> cannabis, are two of the, they're basically unregulated, um, but have the highest amount of mold in them. So much mold in our coffee and in our, in on our cannabis. So I, I third party test anything before I give it to my mom. So I take the substance, I take it to Santa Cruz Labs, which is right in Santa Cruz, which is where I live, and I have them test it because, and I, I always get the information from the company themselves, um, I can't remember the sh whatever it is of the sheep, but then I third part I third party test it because organic is very very important. And they have three different levels, right? I mean, or four different levels they show in the of what? Like economic economy, some premium. Yes. Yeah, not just the whatever. pesticides, but yeah, changing the way that you know. Is, is there a difference? I mean, rea in reality, or is it just the economics? The That's thing with, so I'll, I'll speak just about hemp CBD real quickly. Hemp is, is a bioaccumulator. So a lot of these companies, these organizations, they're using hemp-derived CBD, and, and, and hemp is a bioaccumulator. That means it has the ability, when you plant it in the ground, to absorb like a sponge everything that's in the ground. All of the pesticides, all of the herbicides, everything, the le like anything that you can find, it has such a strong capacity to absorb all of that into the plant. So super important to know that where you're getting your CBD, this is, there's so much information, I'm really glad you asked that, absolutely organic. It also hemp plants, they, you know, they said that if they plant hemp in Fukushima, clear all of that up, right? But it just has this, just this really beautiful ability, you know, to change. And they're also using it in agriculture. So, so clearing up, you know, the stagnation that's happening, you know, in our soil so that they can start replanting other types of agriculture. So hemp is being used in many different areas on many different levels, but yes, helping clean up the planet as well. So a lot of different levels. Uh, some comments on coffee. Uh, apparently uh, the okra toxin in coffee is quite toxic. And Dave Asprey had talked to a Japanese person who said, oh, we export all our moldy coffee to the U.S. because they don't care. Absolutely. Yeah, yeah, that's another one. So I, I, I do bulletproof, too. <laughs> yeah. any, Sorry. any comments about any other side effects that any of the studies that you looked at um, uh, found? And I, I just might add, I had a relative who... Um, can you hear? Okay. Um, I had a relative who um, took CBD because of back pain and some other pain and eventually um, got really lax bowels and extremely constipated and then got necrotic bowel. And there was some question as to whether the CBD might have affected that. So great question. I, um, I'll... I'll I will preface my answer by saying I think it's really important anyone who's, go who's using CBD or cannabis to work with their health professional, whoever your doctor is, I think it's really important to involve your doctor in this uh, because we, 
everyone's going to experience it differently, right? I'm, I'm saying that we don't have the receptors in our brain, so you can't stop your respiration. You're not going to pass, you're not going to die, you know, from, you know, from an overdose. But all of the other different pathways, it's, we need so much more research. That's, you know, that's part of it. Like, we don't have enough research, you know, to, to tell us what's actually happening in, in individuals, like humans. The one thing that I do know, as far as side effects, the one thing that I do know that it influenced the P450 pathways, and this is why it's important to, and, and that can be, it's not like one drug, right, that can be any amount of drugs, right, that influences it. So, in, for instance, you know, with my, with my mom, it was influencing the way that her body was breaking down some of her opioids. But in some people, what happens is it breaks it down faster, and for some people, it breaks it down slower. So you might get an accumulation of it, or you might release it quicker from the body. You know, so again, everyone's completely different. You know, and this could be true with your anxiety or depression medications. Like, it's all completely different because it's changing. You know, it, there's an influence, anyways, on the P450 pathways. So I think it's important to work with your medical doctor. I think it's important to take notes on what you're experiencing, especially if you're on, a, on, on medication, right? So involve your physician. As far as the... The diarrhea, like changing the way the bowel, it does, it does influence motility of the GI system, or constipation. I, yeah, and I, or maybe this person wasn't getting it enough, I don't know, because it helps, it really helps eliminate. Um, I know a lot of people that's helped with specifically with constipation, um, but yeah, I, it's hard to know. And was it organic? <laughs> was it organic? So. Hold on. Yes. Just one more question, but we've got to make it short. Absolutely. And then the other thing is, you know, I would kind of give the caveat of a doctor that kind of knows something about it rather than the doctor that her grandmother went to that My probably aunts, didn't yeah. know anything but said no. Absolutely. So. Yeah. And be a health advocate for yourself, too. Dr. Shade is a really good doctor for that. And um, I was going to talk about the toxins and how... You know, I was doing a lot of CBD products and, and THC products, and I was not, didn't really like the way they taste. Mm -hmm. I felt really bad after. I just mm -hmm. felt, like, mm -hmm. weird. And mm -hmm. then I tried to make my own CBD, mm -hmm. and I was going to SC Santa Cruz Labs, uh -huh. and it's very, very hard to make a product that doesn't have toxins in it. I found Quicksilver, mm -hmm. and then I really liked the products, and then mm -hmm. I found they did a Prime My Body. And yeah. All the Prime My Body is the thing I like about it. It has a certificate with every mm -hmm. batch. Yeah. And Dr. Shea was a biodynamic farmer before. Yeah. So you're talking yeah. about source. And for yeah. me, the way something is sourced is very, very important. Just like you're talking about. Yeah. So I absolutely concur on that. Yeah. But yeah, Dr. Shea's a really good person to be looking up on YouTube about that. Absolutely. Thank you. Yeah, I follow a lot of his stuff too. And, so, and, the, and, and last thing. So one of the side effects, again, because we're upregulating our antioxidant pathways, we do start detoxing, right? So, so sometimes there's the detoxing, you know, side effects that people experience when it's working really well. Okay, let's you guys give are a amazing. Good hand. Thank you. <laughs> and Thank you. it'll be a 10 minute break. We'll be here at 9.05 promptly so we can start our second speaker. Thank you.